Hi, everyone. Welcome to this breakout session. Um, so uh, the vision for this breakout session, not that I've ever been to uh, an Apple iPhone announcement event, but uh, you know, they do, uh, Apple does their, their big, um, you know, well-polished presentation. And then after that, I'll, you know, they, they announce a new iPhone and then they let a lot of people come to like, you know, the secret back room and like be hands on with a new iPhone and, and, uh, you know, try things out. Uh, that was the vision for this. Like let people come here, be hands on with the platform, go one on one with people who are, uh, really well versed with the accessibility we put in the system. Uh, you know, people who coded stuff and people just know how to use the, the blocks and the editor to that. Um, and yeah. However, there's a lot of you. I'm not sure if the logistics of that were going to work. So we're trying to figure this out on the fly here. We are creating a Google Sheet where you guys can paste your email addresses. And then we will invite you to our alpha environment so you can just get in as a user when you have your laptops and just go to town. Um, so that we're getting that set up. Um, I think it is set up at bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash NASA alpha. There we go. NASA Alpha, all one word, no dash. Yep, Stacy's a champion. So if you go there, go to that Google Sheet, start throwing your email addresses in, and then I think someone is gonna start inviting y'all with user accounts to the Alpha. So while we're doing that though, um, I think we've got a few different mics set up around the room, so maybe we could take some open questions now for everyone to hear while we're getting all that set up. Um, and then I think after we've taken some questions, then we might kind of squished together in different groups so that all the folks who have accessibility questions and want to see that in action maybe can go around right with, with Amber um, so we can kind of divide and conquer. But first, questions. Want to come up to the mic, please? Hi, thank you. Uh, a quick question, so in developing your block theme, I guess kind of a two-parter, did you use WordPress core blocks? And I guess question one, question two, what was your thought process on like how to develop a particular part of a site? Is it like a, a pattern, a core block, a custom yeah. block? Like what was sort of the decision tree you had to run through to make that decision? Um, all right, so there's a lot in that, a lot, lot of parts to that. So um, yes, we used core blocks. Um, there were some core blocks that we turned off and then the most interesting thing we did was we had to augment some of the core blocks. So the most obvious example are like the image and video blocks. They didn't meet um, the, you know, the you know, captioning specifications and stuff like that that NASA had and wanted. So basically we had to augment those things with, and, and kind of figure out a way to layer like our own image block that was kind of built on top of the core image block. Um, in, far, in terms of uh, what was a pattern and you know what was a block, um, you know the the HDS Atomic Design System pretty much defined like the blocks that we do we were going to do. And, and one of the key things we had to do was figure out. So there's a lot of different post types. You know, certain blocks only work on certain post types, uh, not others. So that was an another decision criteria we had. We've got post types that are full width, basically post types, and and other post types that are you know. Um, two column post types, um, or at least layouts. And so not all the blocks work in that way. They're not intended for all that use. Um, and then the patterns, um, you know, uh, as, as we were talking about in the uh, keynote, it was, you know, giving people, uh, when we first put users on this thing, that there was like, uh, there were uh, something like 25 custom blocks that brought this design system to life. And, and that, it was super overwhelming to them. Um, they, uh, they really didn't know where to start. So then we, that's when we started with like the concept of a pattern and, um, the design system kind of like had some specifications for those combinations. So we kind of started with that. And as we talked about, like, that was great. That kind of moved people along the content creation user journey. Um, and so right now we're at the point of like, like, all right, how do we get them to move past those things and break free and feel more comfortable starting out with a blank canvas? and assembling blocks in unique ways to tell their unique stories. I don't know exactly how to ask the question, because um, I manage a team of developers. I, I haven't written code in, in a long time, although I did contribute yesterday. So um, We have a platform that we built on top of WordPress, and we leverage Gutenberg. But one of the things that was a challenge for us, and we went 
to using ACF instead as the in-place editor experience. Um, can you talk about, did you create a framework for all of those form fields and things like that for the in-place editor and talk a little bit about how you manage having to create, if I remember correctly, you have to have two sort of render views, one for the render on the, the front end web page and then one uh, for the, you know a component for the, the back end editing experience. Yeah, I'm kind of looking around for a software developer who could answer that question better than I can. Yeah. <laughs> so when building a Gutenberg block, uh, uh, right here, the in-place editing experience, did you uh, create your own framework for all the, the form fields and things like that to manage the uh, content editing experience and then talk a little bit about maybe how you handle the, the, the development of the render view for the uh, front end versus the back end. If I remember correctly, you have to sort of build two different versions of every component, yep. one for the back end and one for the front end. Yeah, let me answer that, that last part first because that's easier to answer. Um, so yes and yes. So in some blocks, we're using both um, like the admin uh, present or the, the JS presentation for the editing screen, and then there's the PHP callback that's rendering front end. Um, in a few cases where it was complex, we opted for server-side render instead. I don't want to say complex. Um, in some situations, it made sense to have server-side render, so we didn't, we weren't fighting with a block that was constantly being updated. Um, and we found that to be sufficient in most cases. Um, and I'm sorry, back to the first part, you asked if there was a framework for, for yeah. fields, right? We've created some components internal that we reuse, um, but otherwise, no. No, it's uh, it's it's pretty much custom per per block. We roll it out as needed. Yeah, um, but to that end, like when I say reusable components, there's things like post selectors that we've we've like iterated on beyond what's in WordPress to to you know focus on different data types. And because we're pulling an external content or sharing content between the science site and the primary site, there's the need to um, to treat that block or that uh, that selector in different ways. And so that's that's been iterated on, and we've created um, custom components that we we reuse uh, in a lot of spots. So while there's not a framework per se, there's probably six or eight of those pieces that, that make up the bulk of constructing block interfaces. Does that answer? Yeah, there can be. Yeah, it depends on the block. Um, and it depends on if there's something similar in the system we can sort of um, say, oh, great, this is these things are actually the same. Like, we can reuse code here. Um, but but no, there there is a lot of work per block. Yes, that's accurate. Yep. Fifty five. It turns out, I counted at dinner the other night and was shocked. Hey you guys, thank you. <clears throat> um, in the keynote, you guys talked about some folks using blocks that you had intended for one purpose for another purpose that was clever and useful and well received. Were there examples where it was not so good? And how did you handle that? Yes, but we don't want to name and shame or put up ugly screenshots. But yes, right. Like, and I think we we mentioned that 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 was one of the challenges is that with great freedom comes great responsibility, and not everybody, right? We have a wide range of different, you know, familiarity with design principles, um, with the user um, experience, best practices. So yes, right. We had folks building some content that was maybe not as pretty, right? We had folks building content that wasn't as accessible, but. We were, um, and Stacy, I know, is, is busily getting you guys all access, but um, Stacy and her team led an effort to um, kind of spot check and QA these different pages and really identify when there was maybe a particular author who was kind of struggling. Like we had a lot of people who were just kind of pasting everything into paragraph blocks. And we're like, we've got other tools for you, right? You can use other things. Um, and so they ended up doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one support, um, building with those users to convert those kind of super text-heavy pages into more block-based things. But, but yes, it's, it's a challenge. How, how do you manage sort of the backwards compatibility or if you, if you have to modify the block in the future, do you, do you have like unit tests built? How, how are you handling it to, to ensure that if somebody's used a block in an unintended way, it doesn't break? Um, if you update or modify it in the future? Uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't hear the beginning of the question. How, when people use blocks in an unexpected way, and like how, and we go in back and we fix that block, right? How do we keep all those existing blocks from breaking? Yeah, 
Yeah, we don't always. Um, you know, there's there's basically a lot of like the the playing plans end up like including a lot of uh, you know special scripts, CLI commands to go back and uh, you know if we have to retrofit something, you know, we're trying not to like uh, um, tell content creators they have to do over. We're, you know, trying to like evolve their content in a way that is is done in a uh, uh, non-obstructive way or something like that. So. Yeah, we do. There's a, a there's a CLI command that Gary wrote called like the kitchen sink. Um, you run that you run that thing, and it basically puts every block on a page for you. So we can do a, we can do some quick testing in that way. Um, does anybody want to try to build a page on the CMS? Do we have another? Yeah, we don't. Gary's giving people access. Oh, okay. So people are doing it already. Great. Like I have a fun question or a serious question. Which would you prefer? Fun. Okay. Has anybody worked on the site from space yet? No. No but. Uh, <laughs> no but. Um, one of our early um, integration and consolidation challenges was the Space Station Research Explorer, which is an app that shares uh, experiment results from the space station that the astronauts, it, it's not in WordPress yet. But the astronauts on the space station are inputting different imagery, data, um, experiment results into this um, space station research explorer tool. And that was sitting on the old CMS. We needed to bring it in. Um, so not yet on WordPress, but we do have parts of the new site that have information directly inputted by astronauts. But yeah, we got we to gotta get this on like a little chip and send it up there, the source code. Good idea. bit.ly slash NASA alpha, no dash. And I hope I got that right. So once I think you're in, but you don't have a role yet, if they can get into the dashboard, but don't see anything yet. Um, so give us a sec, we're granting permissions as we go. And we're gonna leave this access up all day, maybe tomorrow as long as you guys don't mess it up too bad. Um, as, long as, so, as long as we don't accidentally give anyone admin. Exactly, <laughs> if we give you admin, don't misuse it because then we will shut it off for everyone. You will ruin, ruin the playground for everyone. Um, <laughs> but we'll leave this up today, hopefully tomorrow, so that you have plenty of time after this, right, to dig into your heart's content. You can find us, we're pretty easy to spot, and we can keep answering questions after you get a chance to dig in. And so just hey. so there's uh, something, to, a visual to look at here, just so there's a visual to look at here while we're you know, ad living here and taking questions and all like I, I invited Amber to come up here and kind of like surf around and show uh, the Accessibility Checker Pro um, capabilities in action. As Abby mentioned, that was something that we cut from um, our keynote, and you know, it's important here. And and uh, you know, you, you may have also seen Amber's uh, uh, post and press release about how uh, there was there's been some evolutions of the her Accessibility Checker product that are a direct result of uh, Equalizes Digital's involvement with this web modernization project. All right. Hey guys, uh, so I work for a legacy publishing company and we're in the midst of migrating from a legacy CMS to WordPress. And I was interested in what your guys' experience with the data migration of your content, specifically to G Gutenberg blocks. Yeah, right. uh, and so we have all of our article content in XSL on our database and we're wanting to basically cleanly migrate that and convert that to Gutenberg blocks without it all coming over as HTML blocks. And so I was wondering if you guys could speak to that migration process and how you guys migrated that content over. It was a nightmare. <laughs> uh, I figured that would be the answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like with, with, with Gutenberg, like we all know we can look at what's stored in the database and we can say, well, how can I make that the destination for what I'm migrating, right? Um, and in reality, sometimes the data you have doesn't map to what you're going to need in the future. So you either need to build a block to accommodate for null values or stuff that, you know, I mean, we, we've all worked with blocks where you start with the properties that are available and then you get in a situation, you go, oh, well, now I need a new block or I need to update this block and now the previous stuff doesn't have the data and, you know, block error. We've all, we've all fought with that. Um, so on the migration front, um, I think my answer is as close as possible to stick to like core blocks because they're a lot easier than whatever crazy contrived thing you can build. 
and then find a pathway to, to grow those up into your um, design system blocks, noting that um, you know, it may be that that core block has the treatments you need to get to where you need to be. It may not. Um, but no, migration's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the answer I was looking for. <laughs> Yeah, you mentioned about um, uh, DAM in the presentation. So, the digital asset management system is it built in the WordPress as a plugin or something or like it's a for NASA Plus, right? I think you're referring to. Um, I think, are you referring to the reference I made to the images.nasa.gov? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, NASA has um, uh, it's called a veil internally. So image it stands for audio, video, imagery library. Um, and it operates, you can all go to it right now, images.nasa.gov. So we'll, when we were doing um, discovery on all this, like asking our content creator users, what's the, you know, what do you want in the next generation of NASA's uh, content management system? Um, you know, they all said like, hey, I, I want to be able to easily use images.nasa.gov stuff. Um, they were, the experience that they were currently doing was they were going there, finding the asset they wanted, they were downloading it having to manipulate it and then uploading it into the current CMS and their current tools. You know, they were dealing with Photoshop and all that kind of stuff. So what we did was uh, basically extend the WordPress media library. So there's um, an asset management framework out there that was built for integration. Um, I think it was for uh, an Adobe Experience Manager integration. But um, so we were able to augment that. Uh, I believe, I think Human Made may have been the company that did a lot of the pioneering work there. So we're basically able to basically able to use that open source code, integrate it into our solution. And essentially what it does is um, when you end up with a media library, there's essentially another tab that you can, so you're choosing between what's stored locally within, uh, uploaded into the media library, or your, there's a, a tab you can select in the interface to uh, search for images.nasa.gov. And it basically you know, retrieves that, allows you to put it into your story, um, I, I also referenced the, uh, you know, the, the user experience where people were, were having to, you know, open up Photoshop locally and, and, start, and crop things and find the right focal point. By far, this is, it's not even close, by far the most beloved feature in our CMS was, um, you've all seen the cover block and the focal point picker on that thing. We applied that thing to every place an image was, even like small little, you know, circular <laughs> avatar icons, like you can zoom in and out of those things. Uh, find the focal point of that. That is by far the most beloved capability from our user community. They absolutely love being able to like, you know, manipulate their images and move things around and tweak things and just alongside of their content as opposed to what they were doing previously, which was like, you know, pulling it down, opening it up in their image editor locally and then putting it back up and just all that stuff was, you know, we've all been there. We all know how uh, time consuming and or annoying it is. So, yeah, the which which aspect? There was a couple things there. Yeah, that's already is open source. I mean, if you go, if if you go, that's in WordPress core. If you go to the cover block, I mean, all that all that stuff is there. You, I mean, that start start there. You know, apply it to a cut. If you're building a custom block, sure, figure out what parts you need there and, and add on to it. But I was just going to add, we have a lot of different image libraries across NASA. So this images.nasa.gov was kind of step one. Um, and I actually, our friends, I'm looking to see if anyone are in the room. Our friends over at JPL who are building the new science.nasa.gov are, are really leading the way on this front. Um, they're trying to consolidate all of these different science image libraries across NASA into one, um, I think, believe using AEM and then have that as a direct image source in the CMS. So. That, that job of trying to consolidate all the image libraries and data into one place for our users is a very in-progress area, but more to come soon. Yep, okay, perfect. Okay, invitation emails aren't going out, but if you put your name in the spreadsheet, go try to do a password reset with that same email. I think probably our, our like mail logger isn't working. As they get, as they get um, the text changes to a lighter color, it means that we're getting them in. So, and we are trying to send those confirmation emails. Okay, so we're trying to send the confirmation emails, but if you see your name in a lighter color on the spreadsheet, go ahead and try a reset password. Um, 
You need the URL, don't you? Yeah. yeah. All right. It's in the spreadsheet. Yep. The alpha URL is in the spreadsheet. Can we type the alpha password? Um, and if we escape out of, I think it's maybe in another tab. To the alpha. Right yeah, yeah. Okay. So here up at the top, NASA. Oh, I'm gonna, we're gonna make it all big. Yeah. Let's yeah. Just give this a heading two with its URL. There we it. go. That sounds like great for accessibility. There we go. Headings are tough, people. Also, okay. So also we're, never do naked links. No naked links. Like this. Don't ever do this. But you don't need the edit. NASA dash gov dash alpha dot go dash vip dot net. bit.ly, you want to type it? bit.ly. Sorry, someone else's computer. <laughs> I know. Um, bit.ly. Yep, you're good. You're good. ly slash NASA Alpha, all one word. Is it capitalized? Thank you. Nope. NASA Alpha. All right. More questions. We got a bunch over in this section. I don't know who's. For this particular environment, you're probably running into uh, the two-factor authentication that's built that, um, honestly, WordPress VIP enforces as, in, as part of WordPress core. Um, however, uh, yes, we do have two-factor authentication. At NASA has its own authentication system. It's SAML-based. Uh, yeah, they're not, <laughs> they're not um, because we can't resist space metaphors. Um, uh, so it's not, that's not set up. You, you might actually see, if you go to the login screen, you might see a reference to it. Uh, it says SAML login, and it, that's not gonna work. But yes, uh, we did have to integrate WordPress with uh, NASA's SAML-based authentication scheme, um, and there's all sorts of, you know, like NASA has its own little IT ecosystem unto itself, and there's, there's aspects of this uh, WordPress project that we've had to integrate with, you know, things like their single sign-on system. Um, give you another example, Abby. No? Okay. <laughs> the, the account, like the whole process of getting an account has, there's a whole ecosystem around that, you know. Uh, yeah. It's and called you know, NASA Asset Account Management System. That's pretty much immaterial there here though. There's a question back there. I have a question uh, around the information architecture. So this is obviously quite a feat to consolidate all this historic information. Um, and then putting them into custom blocks and building out pages and, you know, custom post types and whatever else you got going on. What thought was given to future proofing this effort? Because obviously your last site was what, 2016? I mean, I remember 2016, that's not super long ago. So, you know, not having to redo this again in five years, yes. eight years, what, how are you handling future proofing in that, your code and in your content? That's our big pitch to NASA leadership, right? We're doing this once so that we do not have to do it again in five years, right? Um, or nine years or however long. Um, so. To that point, right, I think choosing WordPress, not like a custom, you know, bespoke CMS, but choosing something that's open source that everyone is actively contributing into is a big part of it. Um, another part to, to kind of future-proof this, you spoke about the IA, right, the information architecture. Um, so if you look at our current site, um, you'll see that a lot of the headings in that navigation are kind of like NASA's campaign-y phrases for stuff. Like there's Moon to Mars. And that's all about the Artemis program, but a lot of people click that because they want to learn about the moon or Mars. And then they get there and it's nothing about that stuff, right? And so NASA's kind of inside lingo, uh, you know, these different campaigns that we are pushing that we want people to know about, right? But people are trying to get to a lot more basic stuff than that and they're really having trouble finding it. So if you notice on kind of the new beta site, um, and if you're not in the alpha yet, you can always go to beta.nasa.gov to see it kind of from the front end. Um, you'll see that, right, we have a solar system menu. You click on a planet, right, you, you go straight there. Um, and a lot of those links you'll notice are heading over to the science.nasa.gov beta um, because we're really trying to, to link those two sites as one user experience. Um, but that's, I, I think, fitting everything into an IA that is topic-based, right, and not org structure-based is a huge piece of it. And then we have, we're trying to make it really flexible. So we're using um, Parsley Analytics lets us look at analytics by category tag. We have stuff tagged with multiple categories, so it can be tagged with a NASA center and the science topic it's talking about and the person, the scientist who's mentioned in the article so that we can tag stuff multiple ways so that people can find it through multiple routes. 
but we, we want, we're working with um, our sister site at Science to come up with like a taxonomy governance pat plan, right? A process to keep that taxonomy up to date, prune out old things that aren't getting new content added, um, hoping to make this a living system, not just on the design front, and, but on the IA as well. Great question. So I have an agency that does website design and development for multiple clients. And I think like a lot of us, we lean on plugins to really kind of make development more rapid. Are you guys using plugins in this site or did you go custom code everything for more kind of like future proofing? Well, Amber's plugin is, is on it. So that's one. Um, Can we show? Yeah, I think that, that, that's why I told you to go drive that thing. Like, well, no, I didn't mean just mine. Show the other one. Can I show them all the plugins that are on there? Oh, uh, I don't know. It's, I'm not allowed. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> I just didn't know how to answer it. I don't really care. Um, so, but yes, the answer is yes, we are using some commercial plugins on there. Um, Rank Math is, is the SEO plugin. A couple of, and there's open source plugins like the uh, asset management framework that I mentioned. Uh, the Newspack converter uh, is using a lot of our uh, migration processes. That's another open source plugin. Uh, but the reality is, like we had to build our own, um, and and, and there's, there's a lot of custom plugins. And because quite honestly, like it's an easy way. It's also kind of a deployment strategy too. Like it's a way, it's a way to get code on there. You know, turn it on, be able to easily deactivate it without having to like do do a rollback as well too. So, so it's a mixture of both. I want to call out like one plugin that we just started scrolling by this um, the uh, ISS Virtual Tour. So that was a group who was putting together, I think, in in Unity, right, um, an entire interactive tour of the ISS. And they're like, how do we get this into WordPress? We're like let's work with you to build a plugin for it, right? So this was kind of step one of that, of, of building a plugin for just that one 3D or interactive thing. Um, our design system calls for a lot more with 3D, with interactive, so we want to kind of take the next step to make this where anyone can kind of bring one of these Unity WebGL items, plug and play it in with Review by Us, of course. Yeah, it, it's actually the uh, a perfect example and um, the poster child right now for that culture of inclusion we want within WebMod program. Um, you know, basically, you know, the stakeholders, there's other stakeholders like this across the agency coming to you know, our team being like, hey, we want this capability. Uh, when, can you, when can you build this? When is it in your roadmap? And sometimes those answers aren't what they want to hear. It's like, well, it's in our roadmap, but it's, it's really, it's far down the roadmap. You know, it's, it's not our priority. But, you know, like we, if there's an invitation. Like if, if, if you have some resources, you have some knowledge, and you want to build it yourself, you know, we'll, we're happy to consider it review it, add it, make sure it doesn't uh, you know, uh, impact performance or security or those kinds of things. And, and so it's a prime example of a, it's a success story, quite honestly. You know, JJ, people might be interested in hearing about some of the thoughts behind, you know, there's a lot of plugins in this site which are custom. Yep. And why some of these things are plugins versus in the theme and why they are individual plugins versus one big one. And I don't know if Gary wants to talk about that. But I feel like people would be interested in that. <laughs> Sorry. I'm giving you a What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> tell them tell them the share the thought behind plugins versus theme, right? Yeah. With the custom stuff and why because we're looking at this, right? And there's 10, 15 custom plugins. There's probably fifty five based on our yeah. counts recently. Yeah, so well, why why actually, custom plugins yeah, yeah, yeah. um or why so many? So there's there's a couple a couple reasons. So in some cases, exists the ability to um, put a plugin out there and have um, selective environments where we activate a feature. Um, so basically, think of a plugin as nothing more than a feature flag. Uh, and, and in some cases, that's literally all it is. It's setting a constant that some other code is, is utilizing. Um, it's a, it's a multi-site. So that's a good point if no one yeah. knew that. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good call, too. Um, other, other reasons they end up as, um, as plugins is sometimes there's isolation. We may be starting down the road on something, and we're just not sure it's actually what users are going to want. As was mentioned in the keynote, sometimes we build things, and it gets in front of people, and, and there was a huge miscommunication because there's a lot of users. There's a lot of layers of communication between what they need and what we're building, um, and the result being there's code that we write and throw away. Um, and it's much easier to do that and tear out a, sim a single plugin um, than it is to... Uh, go into your core plugin or whatnot and, and disconnect all that stuff. Um, as far as uh, what goes in the theme and what, what doesn't, um, 
you know, like we tried to isolate logic um, as much as possible from the theme to, so the theme was just uh, presentation considerations um, and keep API related, related things and other logic and plugins. Um, I say try, you know, it, it's, it's uh, sometimes it's just pragmatic. Like I'm working in this one file, it's, it's you know, a couple conditionals, let's go. Um, so it's not, you know, it could be cleaner, but to, to that end, you know, we, the, the plugins give us the ability to isolate bits of logic as opposed to have it all activated. Just gonna give a plug quick. Everyone in the spreadsheet should now have an account. So even if you hadn't gotten an email, um, go ahead and go do a reset password with that same email and you should be able to get in. Okay, I think I saw your hand first. We're still granting roles. And so we'll, we're gonna stick around maybe in the hallway to keep answering questions, but also keep troubleshooting to make sure everyone get access, so. Okay. A bit. Yeah, um, I think the answer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the, I think I'll give it I'll give it an answer through an example um, because there's there's a lot of disparate pieces that make it in there and if you if you if you start looking at plugins there's some things where you're like this seems like it shouldn't be its own standalone thing but the reality is consolidating all of this content from years you get in situations where you're dealing with strange things so um, a good example on that is JJ was alluding to SSRE which stands for Space Station Research Explorer. Um, and what SSRE does is um, they consolidate reporting from the space station and make it available to researchers around the world. So they've got a really strict mandate on what's available and how it's available, and they have some design considerations that are external to what's in the HDS, uh, Horizon Design System spec, um, outside USWDS. Um, and the whole thing is baked on this, um, uh, like Microsoft SQL database and an enormous um, monolithic JavaScript app that grabs all the research and then renders it on the front end. So um, it's not a decision any of us in this room would make when building it, but at the time when they built it, it was the right decision, and now they're handcuffed by some of these decisions just because of legacy um, you know, stuff. So what we were able to do is help them port that into WordPress. So there's this you know, header and footer of the site that wraps this research explorer. Um, and it was really cool to work with that team because you know, they, they knew their technology, they didn't know WordPress, but to, to kind of put that in place, um, and give them the tooling they needed to move forward has enabled them to be integrated with the site from day one. When we go live, SSRE won't lose anything, um, and and to you know expose the stuff that they're managed to expose. I know this doesn't answer like your question as far as like cool new tech. Um, I think it's indicative of the project though. Sometimes our decisions are are sort of made for us, and we just have to live with what's there and and go with that. Yeah. Uh, I'll I'll add a little bit to that. Like some of the technical decisions we make were just not to deviate from WordPress in, in this massive way. Like if we're gonna, if we're gonna um, you know, again, this culture of inclusion of all these developers around the agency, if we're gonna be successful with that, like making sure that it's, it's close to uh, you know, WordPress standards and the ability for them to be successful in that way is, is important to us. All right, we have uh, a few minutes left. Go ahead, sir. So I have a question related to plugins, but more on customization side. And you know, most plugins add functionality, but you had to remove some functionalities. I saw on core blocks that you don't display some controls. Uh, can you like expand on that? What you had to do? Why did you do that? Also related to that, uh, what about using some sort of uh, roles permissions? So whether some users are yeah. blocks are locked or not, and how would you go about that? Um, you want to talk to the roles? Yeah. So there's, I think there's like five active roles in the system that sort of range between administrator and, and editor and, and author. Um, and users, I mean, by and large, kind of identify what their needs case are. You know, the higher up they go, the more critical eye um, folks that approve that uh, give it. But the reality is um, we could have tons and tons of roles, but the use cases are pretty specific. There's, there's actually some users where the role is created and they have a, like one use case, so in addition to that, they've got some capabilities added to that, that one user to handle this single thing that happens within the site. Um, uh, sorry, and then what was the other part of the question? 
I'm mostly interested about controls, like removing then, uh, you know, like how uh, how far you did about that, like whether it's like an uh, admin could do more or the, because we see only a single role right now, right? Yeah. So, so on the, on the, um, so specific, I guess I'll answer it a couple ways. So because we're using SAML on the primary site, people aren't just logging with email address. Um, as like, as soon as they're, they're in the system, they enter into the subscriber and their role is elevated to what they need. Um, at the point they no longer have access to the system, SAML doesn't work. So they can't log into the site. They can't log into anything. So there's like a, an immediate lockout from a risk perspective there. Um, but, but I mean, in those, in those, in those five roles we have available, it's, it's really like, what's, what's the need the user needs, what does the user need to accomplish? And then sort of working back from there, what role meets that requirement? It's not a one size fits all type situation. There's also some secret roles. Secret. Yeah, there's some secret roles that are specific to, um, you know, really identifying at the individual user level, uh, like who can make changes to the home page, who can make changes to the main menu system. Um, you know, because of there's just, there's just, there's just tighter governance around of, of all that stuff around NASA. All right, I think we have one more question or time for one more question, I should say. Go ahead. So, uh, if we could go back to, uh, to the users using blocks in their own way and uh, apart from the intended design. So, is there any framework that we can think of because, uh, you know, some. Are there any constraints that we can build or some kind of communication around a certain block which tells the user that the intended person, uh, the intended use of the block? So that kind of Yeah, thing. so we've certainly tried that. Um, Stacy, you want to answer that? Our web content producer in chief. Yeah, so when we have a new block that gets released or even just a, a version update, we have multiple channels that we communicate to the um, users about the new block or update to it. Uh, we do a blog and a newsletter for our user community because we have, you know, what was it, 440 users? 436. 436 users in the system. And then we also have what we call an open office hours forum. And usually what we'll do is a, a demo in the open office hours to show the users, you know, this is how we use this and this is, you know, kind of the intended use of it and, you know, let them, you know, take it for a test run. And, you know, if we come across a case where maybe it's, you know, just completely off the wall, then we might reach out to that user and say, hey, you want to, you know, maybe try it this way. But really, overall, you know, we're working with a really amazing group of creatives and they, they do really, really awesome work with the blocks. So it takes just a little bit of training and communication to show them how to use everything. So one last thing I'll add to that, like, you know, you, you roll out these capabilities and um, you have a vision for how they're going to be used and there's intention for how they're going to be used, but you will have a user or a set of users who will try to explore the outer fringes of what's possible with all that. So one thing I would strongly advise you to do is, you know, make that part of your uh, quality control and quality assurance cycles, like put, put bad data into these blocks, like put the wrong characters in there and see what happens. Cause you know, they are gonna, they are gonna try to put, you know, characters that you don't think were meant to go in there in those places. So, all right. Um, thank you all very much for joining and, and thank you all for being flexible. This wasn't the way we envisioned this to go, but hopefully you got something out of it. Um, if we're all around, we're all, you know, pretty clearly identifiable. So uh, if you want to sit down and like look at uh, some code with somebody, we can try to do that. If you want to get hands on and, and with one of us individually, we're happy to just, we're approachable and nice people. So feel free to do that. <laughs>